This is episode number 158. Today we're featuring artist Jay Moore. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plen Air Podcast. I'm Eric Rhodes, and this podcast is all about the outdoor painting movement. People love going outdoors to paint, Plen Air painting, because you're outside, you're creative, you're challenged, you're social, you're traveling the world, and meeting new friends having time at locations instead of a quick photo, and your paintings will, of course, make great memories. I like to call it the new golf. Well, time sure is flying by. It's hard to believe January is over already soon. We're going to be at the plein air convention, and spring will be upon us. I'm told there are, as of today, only 115 seats left. Seems impossible because, they're, you know, they're almost all gone. Anyway, with this spectacular lineup, if you check it out on the website, pleinairconvention.com, I suspect everybody is going to get their seats soon because nobody wants to miss out this one. This is the biggest and the best. Great lineup. You don't want to miss it. It's a week of painting with your friends and instruction by over 80 top instructors. Plus, there are people, the world's finest painters are going to be there working with you in the field. Of course, if you don't need any help, you can just paint and have fun. Of course, you don't need to paint. You don't have to paint. But if you want to, you can. And so be sure and sign up at plenairconvention.com. We also have some new things we're getting ready to announce about the Plenair Convention, which might drive some tickets even further along. Also, at the convention, we're going to award $30,000 in cash prizes. Actually, our competition is all cash. The only prize that's not cash are you get recognition prizes, too, like you get uh, the cover of Plein Air magazine, or you get a story in Plein Air magazine, or you get a uh, article in Plein Air Today, our newsletter, and th- those are the only things. But you know, a lot of people pump up and say their prizes are worth all this money when in reality, it's not cash. We're cash, all cash. And so, winner gets fifteen thousand bucks and the cover of Plein Air magazine. Enter your best paintings at PlenAirSalon.com, and remember that if you win any category during the of uh, the bi-monthly competition, any one of them, you are entered into the annual, and the annual is where the judging is done and where the big prizes take place. And so make sure to enter your paintings at plenairsalon.com. Enter categories, that's one of the tricks. Also, one of the other tricks is some judges like what other judges don't like, and so when you keep entering things uh, that haven't won yet, you have a better chance, I would think. Anyway, coming up after the interview, I'm going to answer some art marketing questions in the Marketing Minute. And I should mention, the Marketing Minute now has its own podcast. And so for people who might not want to listen to this podcast, which I can't imagine why they wouldn't, but want just marketing, uh, well, they can just get a podcast for the Marketing Minute now. and, And we put all the Marketing Minutes up as its own podcast. In the meantime, let's get right to our interview with this excellent artist, Jay Moore. Jay Moore, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Well, hello, Eric. Very pleased to be on the phone with you today. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad I'm anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, we're going to talk about your career. We're going to talk about Plein Air painting. What else are we going to talk about? Um, Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. We can talk about what's going on here in Colorado or any other questions you might have. Okay. All right. Terrific. Um, I understand that you had a near death experience when plein air painting one time. Is that right? Um, yeah, that was pretty close. Yeah, we make did sure, have a close call. Make sure you remind me to talk about that before we end the podcast. Sure. So how did this, uh, this painting thing begin for you? Well, I, I never really thought it was something 
that was too unique for people. I had a next door neighbor that was a really good artist and he and I would just draw pictures for our classmates. And uh, back in sixth grade, we would sell them for 35 cents, which was what a lunch cost back then. And uh, if it was real hard, we might charge a little bit more, 50 cents or something. And then in, um, in junior high, they, they put me in a gifted and talented program where I didn't have to take the other classes. I just um, did internships um, with other artists, uh, professional artists. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe you can make a living at this. Um, and then in high school, my, my teachers would, would buy my art assignments um, for $20 or $30 or something. So um, that was enough to help convince my dad to let me to take the leap and go into art school right out of high school. Your teachers were actually buying art from you. That's cool. Yeah. And and so what happened? You went to art school? So I went to Colorado Institute of Art uh, for what they called back then an advertising design degree. So it was mostly graphic arts, but there was some life drawing and um, color theory and, and things like that. Um, and then I went into uh, graphic design straight out of school uh, with a firm here in Denver that was a very a rigorous and high quality firm, but um, most people only lasted about three months there because it was it was such a difficult art director to work with. But I, I was there almost two years, and that was a great learning curve for me, and um, really helped me to be a perfectionist in what I did. Then I figured out that they were paying me oh, about ten dollars an hour while they were billing about one hundred and fifty dollars an hour for my illustration. So I. Um, went out and started freelancing and uh, did that here um, in Denver for about 10 years. Um, and then took a workshop uh, from Clyde Aspivig back in the nineties or mm, no, it was late eighties, early nineties. And I wasn't even really supposed to get into that class. The workshop was full, but um, the very new art students league of Denver was just opening down the, the hallway from us and, and so we let them borrow our fax machine and our copier. And so as a payback for uh, helping them out, they let me be the, the extra student in, in Clyde's class. And that was kind of the turning point uh, for me as far as, you know, making the jump from illustrator to, to fine artist. Um, you know, I remember Clyde saying, Jay, you're going to have to paint every day. You know, you got to paint outdoors every day. And I couldn't quite figure out how to do that. I'm like, well, I'm supporting a family. I got all these illustration deadlines. He's like, well, that's up to you, but that's what you're going to have to do. And, and he was absolutely right. I mean, that's what it took for me to, to eventually make the, make the break over to, to easel painting. So that was about uh, in the mid nineties, I would say. And I've been doing landscapes since then. So, so do you, do you go out every day? Do you still go out every day? Uh, no, I don't go out every day. Now I do mostly um, studio painting. But when I started in to find out, I was just newly married and we, you know, I barely had enough money to pay for the Clyde Civics class. And so I just slept in my car and, and took a bath in the river up in the mountains, you know, before the workshop and, you know, did it that way. And then when I started plein air painting, I would just go by the grocery store and, and then drive down a dirt road and paint my way along. And at the end of the road, I would, you know, at sunset, I would just keep painting and tried to pick a spot at the end of the day that was near a lake or a river. And I would fish for my dinner. And if I caught a fish, I had dinner. If I didn't, I didn't. And um, then I did that for about five years. It was all, you know, every day was plein air painting because I couldn't afford a studio and was just trying to get as much practice as possible. So, so you're a diehard. So art dealers would, yeah. Well, I'm. I grew up in the mountains, so um, I'm comfortable just driving up in the mountains and throwing my sleeping bag on the ground. And I've spent a lot of nights under the stars, so I'm pretty, pretty comfortable out in the woods that way. Um, my brothers were on the Alpine rescue team, so they kind of taught me survival stuff. And so, yeah, at first it was just pure plain air painting, and then you know, uh, in all sizes, I would do, you know, eight by tens all the way up to, you know, almost 30 by forties out on location. And then I would sell them to art dealers here in Denver. Um, I had all these plein air paintings and so I didn't know what to do with them. So I put a dozen or so in a coffee shop in downtown Denver. Um, 
And an art dealer called me and he said, I'd like to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. And he says, no, today, I want to talk to you today. <laughs> so he ended up representing my work for about five or seven years. And then he introduced me to another art dealer. And so I was kind of under the radar uh, for quite a while. Um, you know, they were selling, uh, well, he's, he's, they sold a hundred paintings a year um, for about 10 years in a row that way. Mm. So, you know, mostly small. I mean, you know, they're plain air works and, and not very expensive, but it really helped to get a, a base under me. Um, and and so then slowly started getting into gallery representation, you know, after, during that period. But uh, but that's, you know, it's a little bit different path than, than some others. And, uh, you know, who knows if some, if a different person would have seen him in a coffee shop or if I would have put him in a different coffee shop, or, you know, a lot of, a lot of, ways that could have gone differently, but, um, I was really, you know, felt happy to be able to make a living painting outside. And at, at the time I, I thought that was the greatest thing. So I want to go uh, back to, I, I want to go back to what you said about, uh, what Clyde told you about the idea of getting out every day for the people who are kind of starting out or listening or trying to figure out how to up their game. Talk about, why that principle is important and, and what you discover through the period of time. So, I mean, well, obviously you need, you need momentum, right? I mean, you, it's hard to just get good at anything just with fits and starts. Um, I'm, I, I've played golf my whole life and there's kind of a, a lot of analogies between being a good painter and a good golfer is, is that, you know, it's extremely difficult for one thing, but, um, to really get a rhythm, you have to get the momentum from the day before and the day before. And, you know, I was painting from sunrise to sunset. So I would do, you know, four or five paintings a day for, you know, up to a week in a row. And then I would, you know, take a nap in the middle of the day. So <laughs> it's a pretty arduous, especially in the summertime when you have a lot more daylight. Um, so, you know, I just got a lot of, a lot of practice, but um, that, you know, observation and learning and catching the line, you know, you get to where you get pretty, pretty confident. There could be a little fleeting lighting situation, you know, it's stormy and then the sun just comes out, you know, and hits the peak, you know, just for a few minutes and you, you've got the the confidence to, to try to capture that, you know, and what you end up doing is you get really good at anticipating and remembering. So you, you see a potential for a view. And so maybe it's a sunrise. And so you kind of anticipate, okay, the sun's going to come up at this angle and cast a shadow here. And then, you know, wham, there it is. And, you know, you get about five minutes of that and then it changes. So you've got to remember, remember what it was like. So plein air painting for me is about anticipating and remembering because the light changes so fast that you can't, you can't follow the shadows and change your colors as the colors change. So, You've got to pick a spot, you know, and I usually do that or, you know, pick a lighting situation. And I usually do that with a thumbnail um, or a series of thumbnails kind of, you know, playing around with the composition so that when I start painting, I, I know, you know, I have a pretty good idea what the painting's going to look like. And then, um, you know, you kind of guess as best as you can what the sky color is going to be or what, where that shadow is going to be. And then when that moment arrives, you just make minor little corrections uh, to the shapes or the, the colors. So rather than, you know, in basketball, it's not, you're not shooting three pointers, you're doing layups, you know, you're, you're just making minor little adjustments and then you can get it pretty close to, to where you want it to be when that moment arrives. Um, so, so that's kind of, you know, how I, how I got into plein air painting. And I, when I was selling with these art dealers, um, back then, uh, there really wasn't even, I don't even know if the people were familiar with the, the word plain air or on location or what that meant versus just when they saw a landscape, they didn't know whether it was indoors or outdoors. So I, I had a film crew uh, follow me for a day in the life of, of my painting. And up in the uh, mountains of Colorado in the wintertime, uh, we got there, you know, they started filming before the sun rose and, and, uh, you know, we hiked around and walked across these frozen uh, rivers. You know, I could have broken through at any time, and got it on film. But um, and then I would they edited it down to 15 minutes and put music to it and everything. And then we would 
um, hand out these VHS tapes to collectors to kind of let them know what goes into a painting. Um, but you know, at, at that point, you know, I was just doing completely plein air paintings, you know, no studio work. So, um, from the beginning to the end was, was all then outside. So studio work, it so sounds that's kind like of how that got started. So, sounds like studio work has kind of taken over. Well, it has only, and that started to do more so once we, once I had children, um, I just didn't want to be gone that much. I didn't want to leave my wife home alone for long periods of time. And so the five years of pure plein air painting was when I was married, but didn't have any children. And so once my son started to be born, I started to curtail in my trips and curtail my trips and tried to, to be around more and, um, tried to be more efficient, you know, uh, with being outside. So the paintings got smaller in the field and they ended up being just field studies. And then, you know, for larger works in the studio, which is what I still do today. I don't really compete, or I mean, I'm complete large canvases out in the field anymore. It's usually just nine by 12 or six by eight. Um, so how do you, how do you for, get the information that you need um, in a study? You take a, um, a study and convert that into a large painting. Are you trying to keep the same energy, brush strokes, obviously colors and things, but are you adding a lot more detail? And how do you... How do you get that detail for the studio painting coming out of your head, coming out of a photo? Um, both. Um, it, I do a lot of editing with the field study and like most artists do, you know, you take this tree out or make this mountain a little higher or, you know, do a lot of editing. So I use my decisions that I made in the field study that kind of sets the, the composition and the, the colors and everything. But as far as information, data, uh, detail, then I use photos for that. But um, I'm trying to keep the the mood and the initial uh, idea, you know, preserved from the field study. Because as any plein air painter knows, you know, that energy is like lightning in a bottle. You can't reproduce it in the studio. Um, so, you know, I keep those decisions, those big decisions that were made in the field, Um and incorporate those into a larger painting. But when, if it's a painting that where you're trying to create depth, for example, you're up on a mountain and you're looking down a valley and maybe you see 30, 40, or even, you know, around Colorado here, you can see for, you know, 60 or more miles. Um, in a field study that, you know, you're just making little color notes, but in a larger painting, you can create those layers of atmosphere and layers of, you know, detail and recession to really, you know, try to make that feel like depth. Um, or if you're, you know, painting water in a field study, of course, you're just dashing little colors notes in, but in a larger painting, you can really make it feel like reflection, really make it feel like water movement and you're seeing down through the water into the stones below. And, um, so and if, you know, a, a, a studio painting, you can really you go with your initial idea, but, but make it more, you can say a lot more with it and try to fool the eye, you know, a lot more on a larger scale. So a lot of times people listening to this want to hear some technique. Um, you know, it's surprising how many different artists approach things completely different ways. Uh, why don't you talk for a minute about painting water and also talk for a minute about painting distance, because I think people would find both of those fascinating. Well, water, um, there, there are principles um, in what makes your eye feel like it's water. I mean, water doesn't have a shape. It doesn't have a color. Um, it, it has a surface, but you can see through the surface, which makes it different than an apple, for example. So you have to create this illusion that your brain um, completes in your mind. So there, it comes to a principle that uh, Wilson Hurley uh, turned me on to it's called principles of visual perception to where um, the seeing actually happens in the brain not in the eye so it goes from the front of your eye of course it crosses over to the other hemisphere and goes to the back of your brain and filters through all of your life experiences and it comes up with an answer of what you're actually seeing so if someone had had never seen a river, I don't know how, maybe they were raised in the desert or something. Um, 
and they went to you know look at my pictures, they wouldn't see it the same way as maybe a, a fly fisherman would see this river. So a fly fisherman would look and say, wow, I can tell how deep that is. I can tell, you know, how clear it is. I can tell where the fish might hang out. Um, so these are all filtered through your experiences. So what I'm trying to do when I paint water or distance uh, depth is what are the cues that your mind is looking for that re- that it sees when it sees water? And these are all subconscious. So like what makes water look like a reflect, what makes a reflection look like it's the surface of the water rather than just a different color next to a different color. So there are certain things that happen on a reflection. Um, The darks get lighter and the lights get darker. So uh, for example, when light, if you've ever been under the water and you see the sunlight kind of shining down through the sun rays coming through the water, that shows you that some of the light is absorbed beneath the surface. So not all of the light is reflective in, in water. It's not a perfect mirror. So um, the colors get richer and the lights get darker and the, the darks get lighter. So that's one principle. So there's about, I don't know, maybe 20 to 50 different principles for each circumstance, whether it's a lake, a stream, the rapids, you know, the Missouri river or, or a high, you know, clear mountain stream. So, uh, you know, the, the glacial water in Canada is different than the water in Colorado is different than the, you know, the water in, you know, the desert somewhere. So, um, you know, is there glacial silt in the water? Is there, um, algae? Is there mud? Is there, you know, what is happening in the water? So there's not really a recipe of, you know, this is how to paint water. Um, but there are principles that kind of apply in most cases. And, you know, the edges get softer, for example, if you have a really texture grassy bank, and then you have a really calm water below it, well, then, of course, that texture of the grass is going to be softened in the reflection. So that's another principle. Um, so when I look at water, I'm looking for those principles and I'm like, aha, okay, there's one. Yep. The darks do get lighter. Okay. And then, yep. The edges do get softer. Okay. Then you keep looking for these other notes. Then you're, you're not really copying what's in front of you. You're just taking those principles and, and, you know, enhancing it. Yeah. The more you enhance those principles, the more it looks like water. It's almost like doing a caricature of of someone, you know, it's, it's a portrait, but you've exaggerated their characteristics to where it really looks like them. And that's the same way when you paint water is if you take those characteristics and kind of enhance them, then, um, it, it almost looks more like water than the actual, the actual view. Interesting. Um, you you should can see down this. into the water. Interesting. You should say this because, you know, m- many artists will say, paint what you see. I just attended a David LaFell workshop. And David said, don't paint what you see. Paint what you know is right. Um, In other words, there are certain principles that he always puts into a painting. You know, for instance, warm shadows. And even though you might be seeing cool shadows, he's saying, no, 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 make them warm. So is this the kind of thing you're referring to, is that knowing that there are certain things that just always seem to ring true? Yeah. And I call them like unlocking the key. So once you've done enough, I mean, uh, the key that unlocks, you know, the secret. So once you've painted outside long enough, you start to see these patterns, these repetitions of, oh yeah, the last time I painted water, that's, that was true there too. And so then the next time, oh yeah, here it is again. And so you, these repetitions, and it's the same whether you're painting snow or clouds or trees or, in, you know, literally anything, flesh tones you see these, these repetitions of what this other, what this characteristic is of whatever you're painting. And once you can unlock those secrets or those patterns, then you can make whatever scene you want look completely um, realistic, even though it's not really what's in front of you. So, you know, if, if people say, well, my paintings look like a photo, I, I say, well, you should see the photo because <laughs> this is nothing like the photo. Um, I've just taken these principles and I've made it what I want to make it as, you know, you can, you can change the shoreline of a lake or you can 
make the river deeper if you want, or you can move clouds around, or you can change the landscape however you want once you know these secrets of, you know, these patterns of nature, and they're all over. And, you know, even if you've been doing this for decades, you still, I can still look for these nuances. So is um, that something that, that just comes before. comes from doing, or is that something that if you were to teach it, you could articulate each one of those principles in different situations? Oh, well, yeah, I could, share you, I could share with, you know, a student, some of the secrets I've found, you know, like I just mentioned a couple of them. Yeah. Um, and then they can observe them for themselves. I mean, I don't, don't take my word for it. Go see if I'm right. And, you know, when you look at a river, see if I'm right. And then, then that, it makes it painting a whole lot easier because you're not copying. You're just, you're just interpreting. And um, this is the case. Uh, I remember when I was first taking life drawing, they said you could tell a really good painter or a, an artist by how much, how many times they had to look up at the model and the, the, the new novice artists were, you know, looking up every, you know, they look up three times and then make one stroke and look up three times to make one stroke. But the masters would look up one time and then, you know, make 20 strokes and look up one time and make 20 because they're just looking, they know what, what they expect to see. And then they're just checking. Is that true? Yep. That's true. So, then they can just, you know, make 20 strokes based on that. And then they look up and check. Yep, that's true. And, um, and just the same way with plain air painting is you don't need a, a, you know, you don't need a ton of time or a ton of reference. You don't need three or four hours. If you know what you're expecting to see, um, you can spend most of your time painting and, and just kind of double checking yourself when you're looking up. So, Painting goes a lot faster that way. It's not like it's a it's a formula. It's you know, like I said, it's different with every um, water situation, for example. Or there's you know, lots of different kinds of clouds and lots of different kinds of trees. But your your level of observation just gets so tuned in to what you, what you're looking at and what you're what you're looking for is that you're not overwhelmed with the with the mass amount of detail and information, you're just looking for some very specific answers. And once you get those, you're like, okay, I know right how to do that. And, and so that's kind of how, how I approach, um, you know, painting in the field. And then even more so when I get into the studio, I can really play with those principles and enhance them. Mm -hmm. Now, what about distance? So in distance, um, in uh, the book, uh, by John Carlson, Carlson's Guide to Landscapes. Um, he does a pretty good job of describing what happens in depth. Um, there are there are four, to me, in, in my way of working, is there are four things that an artist can use at their disposal to enhance or, or subdue, and they're color, contrast, detail, and edges. And so the closer something is, the more color, the more contrast, the more detail, the more edges, the harder the edges. The further away, you start to lose those. And there are, from the, from the color spectrum, there are certain colors that disappear first and then second and then third. Um, you know, yellow is the first and then orange and then red and then green and blue. So that's why mountains in the distance are, are blue because of the, the wavelength of the of that color, but, um, but that's pretty easy to, to understand. And that's another one of those, um, keys that, you know, it's not just one thing that makes something look like it's further away. Um, it's, you know, it's a series of things, just like with the reflection, it's a series of these secrets and some of them are obvious, you know, things in the distance get smaller. Well, that's, that's perspective one oh one, but, there's a lot of other things that you have to do to really convince the eye that, that that's depth. And the more that I paint, when I create distance, I just don't want to create an arbitrary distance. I want to create the exact distance. So if there's a tree that's 150 yards off into the distance, I want to lose the color, the contrast, detail, and edges that's appropriate for 150 yards away. 
And then if there's another tree, you know, 50 yards behind that, I want it to look like it's exactly 50 yards behind that. And if there's a mountain that's, you know, 10 miles away, I want it to look like 10 miles away, not two miles away and not 20 miles away. So how do you do that? So through observation, I mean, through, you know, the only way really is, is by direct observation. You're not going to, Obviously, a, a photograph's not going to tell you that accurate information is, is what, how much of the edges you lose at that distance. It has to be your two eyes, you know, with uh, binocular vision, seeing that depth, that three dimensions. So let's, let's um, probe that so, for just, let's probe it for just a second, because I think there are probably a lot of people curious about this. Let's use your example of a, a tree that's 10 feet in front of you and a tree that's 50 feet back. Obviously, you've got perspective that can in, enhance that that sense of the tree. You know, one's going to be closer and taller. One's going to be further back and maybe not as tall. But do do the values essentially stay the same but get grayed back? Uh, let's say the tree trunk. How, how do you think about that? So it really goes back to the the four things that that's how I think about it with my own painting is I, I, I try to simple it down, simplify it down to these four things. So color, I look at, okay, how does the color change as it goes off into the distance? Is it lighter, darker, more red, more blue? Um, so lighter, darker, warmer, cooler on color. Contrast is what happens with the lights and the darks. What happens with the highlights and the shadows? So they get closer together as it gets further away. But as I'm looking at these two trees, you can just look at the two and compare. Okay, I compare the dark against the dark, and I compare the light against the light. And then the edges, your eye. Um, now, there's a whole other discussion on how our eye sees, but um, if you whatever you focus on becomes a, a hard edge when you're the way our, our eye is bitten, our eye is made. There's a tiny little phobia in the back of our retina that keeps what our laser beam focus. But if you look at one, look at the foreground tree and don't move your eye and with your peripheral vision, how much of how much detail can you see on that distant tree? That's what you should be painting. So that brings so, up, that brings up a great debate. Um, I, I can think of two different artists who have two differing opinions on that subject. One, I, I won't mention names. But one artist would say, I want everything to be in focus so that as the eye moves around, it's in focus when they look at it. The other one would say, no, I want to force them to focus on one particular thing and soften and, and uh, make less dramatic the other things so that I'm controlling where the eye goes. Which are you? Controlling? I'd say go to the masters. Go to the museums and see what they do. And well, you'll both, notice both that, of these guys are masters. <laughs> well, I know, but I mean, as far as how I would perceive it, well, I've done, because I wanted to find the answer to that question, too. It's a, it's a big answer. So I went to the museums, and I went up to a whole room. I went to the Metropolitan Museum, and there's a whole room of Rembrandt in there. And it hit me over the head like a sledgehammer that these are 90% soft edges and only 10% hard edges. So... And then I would go, you know, into, John, you know, a John Singer Sargent painting. And I look, these are 90% soft edges, 10% hard edges. And then I would go to, you know, uh, you know, a landscape painter that I respect. And I'd be like, I'll be darned. You know, you go to a Richard Schmidt painting and you say, how many hard edges and how many soft edges? So I'll let the artists make their own decisions on that. But for me, I really, I'm, I'm very careful about my edges and I, I I think that in my opinion if if there's hard edges everywhere it's um, hard for your eyes to take all that in good thank you for that that was very helpful so um, help help everybody understand how you would approach a plein air painting uh, what is your process do you start with a thumbnail yeah, I always do. I'm very, very strict about that. Whether Even if it's the fleeting light situation, I always start with the thumbnail because that's where the big decisions are made. Um, the amount of time you invest in a, in a two or three minute thumbnail is like an insurance policy for not wasting the next two or three hours. Um, 
you make all your big decisions there, where your, you know, where your focal point's going to be, where your big shapes, you know, if it's a case where the shadows are moving quickly, you lock in your shadows on your thumbnail and then you don't move them no matter what, you know? So if it's not in your thumbnail, you don't put it in your painting period. And I've ruined a lot of paintings early on trying to, you know, Chase add things light. in later that weren't in pardon chasing light. Yeah, right. It keeps you from chasing the light and being, you know, sidetracked by something else that happens later on. Um, and if, you know, if I'm painting a meadow and, you know, with a mountain behind it and all of a sudden, you know, a big bull elk comes wandering into the meadow, <laughs> it's tempting to put him in, but that's for another painting, you know, finish your painting. Then, you know, you can do another painting of the elk later. So if something amazing happens in the middle of your painting, that's fine. That's another painting for another time, but maybe do a little, you know, sketch of it or take a picture or something, but you know, don't, don't change horses midstream on your first painting or, or you're going to end up in trouble. At least, at least I always did. Yeah, that's great advice. So I'm, I'm very strict about that. Um, and then I, um, so once I have the thumbnail, I follow the thumbnail. So I make little tick marks on the side of my thumbnail like right in the middle, halfway marks on horizontal and vertical. And then on my canvas, I make the same little tick marks so that I can convey the drawing of my thumbnail over to my canvas in proportion. Because in my thumbnail, I'm making very quick, intuitive decisions about, you know, sizes and relationships and composition. And, you know, these are just, you know, I'm in the heat of the moment. You're all excited. The light's right there. And so these, these quick decisions are, are part of your subconscious that are way smarter than what we could sit down and analyze. So I really trust that first impression and that enthusiasm. And I copy the thumbnail literally over to my little canvas. And then I start tearing away, you know, painting the colors as fast as I can. But if I've locked in those shadows, even if it takes me another 10 or 15 minutes and the shadows have shifted a little, I've got them locked in on my thumbnail. So if I ever get um, lost about where these shadows should be, you know, I, I just go back and say, oh, yeah, that shadow stretches all the way over here. And that's my initial idea, and I don't, I don't vary from that. Do you try to connect your shadows? Um, I, try to, I try to keep my paintings within three or four main shapes. So, yeah, sometimes that means either connecting them or if they're separate, I make them two different values. So they're like two different shapes. Okay. So the the rest of your painting yeah. process, once you've got your shadows laid down, what's next? First off, are you starting with an undertone or are you, you going straight onto white canvas? No, I pretty much paint straight in. I, um, I used to tone my canvas, but there was, you know, times where, you know, if you, if you put a warm wash on your uh, canvas and then you're trying to paint, you know, snow or something, and then you're, you know, it just kind of, um, I just it worked better for me to just paint directly, just finish as I go. So once I have my, my sketch under my panel, I try to hit, and I, I think Kevin McPherson um, hit on this where he said the first brush stroke, make sure you can nail it, you know, <laughs> stick it, you know, the, the right color, the right value um, on your first brush stroke. And then, and then you compare that your next color to that first color that's right on. And I know other artists kind of, approximate and wash in and it works well for them to kind of work their way to the finish. But I just kind of finish as I go um, and try to be accurate to accurate to accurate rather than approximate to approximate to approximate. And then that way your, your brush strokes are, are part of your finished piece. I mean, it's, it's all, it's all the prima all at once, you know, you dash it in and leave it and you kind of know ahead of time what you're, what you're trying to achieve with this particular painting. And, you know, if it's the strong shadows or if it's the warm light or if it's the texture or um, you know, whatever your initial concept is. Um, that's another thing that I really learned as I got older is, um, is to really have a definite idea with the painting, what your, what your goal, your objective is, what do you have to say? Why did you paint this? Not just because it's pretty, but um, you know, early on, I would just paint a tree or a rock or, <laughs> a, you know, a tractor or whatever, but I didn't have any emotion into it. It was just kind of copying what was in front of me. And, 
And nowadays I try to really think, well, what, you know, what about this tractor? Why, why am I interested in this? You know? And I think, well, my grandfather had a tractor or, you know, so get yourself kind of invested in what do I like about this tractor? Is it the, the, the shape of it? Is it the color? Is it the patina? Is it the shadows on it? Is it the form? Is it the, you know, and then once you find that out, let's say it's the patina, then everything on that painting has to make the patina stand out. You know, it's like a, a, a star of a, of a play and then all the supporting characters. So you can't have all, you know, can't have everybody, you know, singing the same level at the same time. You have to have one lead and then the other supporting cast. And so if, if it's the patina on the, on the tractor, then you might decide to gray down the grass a little bit to make the color of that rust, you know, pop out a little bit more. So you de subordinate other areas to enhance what your main um, purpose in painting the painting is. And so that's another one of those things where you don't copy exactly what is in front of you. You have a statement and something you want to say personally, and then you make changes to, to enhance that. So would you say that you have a Jay Moore style? I don't know. <laughs> Other people have said that, but I, um, I just, every painting I, um, dictates what the style would be. So if it's, if the whole theme of the painting is dramatic lighting, then that dictates how I put the paint down. If the whole thing is, um, you know, texture on snow, then that dictates. If the whole painting is, you know, a vast distance, then, then that dictates it. Um, I don't, um, I don't always start in the same place. I don't always start with the darkest dark. And I, sometimes I start with the lightest light and, you know, get that keyed in first. Um, it just, I really don't have any formulas about how I approach any, any particular painting. I, like I said, I pick a pick what compelled me to do this painting, and then even how I start the painting is dictated by whatever that decision is to make sure that I can, you know, nail it and get it, you know, just what I'm after. So talk to me about so, some of your experiences um, painting outdoors. Well, I... Um, with all that time painting outdoors, it, it was, um, you have a lot of stories to tell because there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's times when I've discovered wild, I've discovered wildfires and tried to put them out myself. There's times where I have had encounters with animals. Um, there's in times where I, you know, nearly drowned. There's been times where we, we, we went up by helicopter into the Canadian Rockies and, uh, a storm came in and the radio that the helicopter was supposed to come pick me up and the radio wasn't working and the, and the clouds were, the cloud ceiling was dropping. So, you know, things can get kind of hairy, um, you know, let alone the cold and the average discomfort, but you know, I've dodged literally dodged lightning bolts before <laughs> where it hits so close to you, you can smell the sulfur, you know, it's, um, uh, so I started keeping journal, uh, I have journal notes of, of those years and still, still do still keep them. But, so I can go back or maybe my grandchildren could go back and, you know, read the accounts of what grandpa used to do out in the, out in the woods with the paintbrush. So how, how did that uh, helicopter trip come out? <laughs> Obviously you made it through it. Yeah, it, well, we, um, we, we started communicating by clicks. They, I could hear them clicking and well, I could hear them talking and like, should we go get Jay? And like, well, no, let's wait for him to call us. He may not be finished yet. And, and, so I'm like clicking away and like, Jay, is that you? And click, click, you know, so like one click for yes, two clicks for no. So we kind of communicated that way and then um, found out I was done and ready to be picked up. So he, you know, flew the helicopter up and we had to go, we just had to go down in the valleys and um, back to my journal notes, you know, we were like 10 feet off the ground um, on our way back. And I remember telling the pilot, I'm like, why are we so close to the ground? <laughs> And he's like, well, clouds and helicopters and mountains don't mix. So he was just having to go down the valley. And we didn't come back the way we came in. We had to go back the opposite way because that's where the valley was. So we had to go 
fly a lot longer uh, to get back and stay underneath the the cloud ceiling. But, you know, if those clouds would have dropped faster, who knows you know, how we would have gotten out of there. Um, or if I, the radio didn't work, you know, that much sooner, you know, who knows. But um, so, so was that your, was <laughs> that your near of, death experience? No, that was the near death experience was um, almost drowning in Alaska. Oh, um, yeah, there's a it's a long story. Um, but there was we, we flew way back in the middle of nowhere um, uh, in, in, in Alaska off of Bristol Bay. Um, you fly south of uh, Big Salmon about an hour and there's a, a place called Ugashic Lakes. And um, so this this collector from Chicago uh, hired me to go up there. He, he was there with me and he wanted paintings of these lakes. So um, we brought our fly rods and, and all of my plein air painting gear. And I was supposed to stay there for three days while they, you know, they fish the first day and I was, then we're going to leave. And, you know, so I started taking a few pictures and kind of scouting around the, the area. And he started crossing this river that was between the two lakes. It was a, you know, big river, <laughs> but you could wade it from Island to Island. And, so I was trying to follow him from island to island. I had my camera in one hand and my fly rod in the other hand, and I started getting washed downstream. I must not have crossed the exact same gravel bar that he was on. And so I remember, you know, um, watching the water go up my waders, up to my belt, to my chest, to my armpits, and I'm thinking, don't swamp. Whatever you do, don't swamp. And I had neoprene waders on because the water was so cold, and I was not wearing a chest strap, which you're always supposed to do. So sure enough, the water started swamping, started pouring into my waders, um, you know, like a torrent. Once it started, it just really poured in there. And so I remember being on my tippy toes, you know, on the gravel, I was losing purchase. I was going down into the lake and I was thinking my camera, I can't lose my camera or else this will, <laughs> this will ruin my commission. And so I'm trying to hold my camera up and my fly rod up and swim at the same time while this river's taking me out into the middle of the lake. And so, um, I was a swimmer when I was younger, so I, I, I didn't panic or anything. I just, I dropped my camera around my neck and, um, started swimming as hard as I could vertically to try to get out of the current. Um, and kept swimming and swimming and swimming as hard as I could. And, and, uh, my, the two collectors that were with me, um, they just said they looked back and heard this little, Ooh, like somebody taking their last breath and they looked over and all that was sticking out was my chin and my nose out of the water. So they go running down the bank and, um, you know, I was so far away, they couldn't really get to me, but I broke through the current. I remember feeling that sensation of not feeling the current anymore. And I just kept swimming and, you know, as hard as I could and got over to the, to the bank and hit my knees on all four and said a prayer and, <laughs> uh, was safe, um, sort of, because then the, you know, it was raining and the water was about 41 degrees. Oh no. And so then I started shivering violently and the bush pilot wasn't supposed to be back for 10 hours. So, um, so my next worry was hypothermia. <laughs> um, so knowing kind of a little bit about outdoors, I knew I had to get out of my wet clothes and thankfully there was an old Eskimo shack there that was covered in moss and kind of yucky inside. But I, went in there and got out of the rain and, and got out of my dry clothes. And, and after a couple hours, you know, stopped shivering. And, and then I thought, well, we've got all this time and my camera is shot. And, um, so I just, I saw them out there fishing. So, but well, Jay, you better get back on the horse. So I threw my waders back on and went back out and got back in the river and, and kept fishing the rest of the day <laughs> with them. But, um, but it was, it was close. And when, uh, that night, this salty old, bush pilot um he made everybody raise a glass at the restaurant that night that i was still alive and so i said why what you know thank you cecil but you know he said she said that was close he said uh last guy that did that he said he's still at the bottom of the lake so it was within you know i don't know short amount of time of either getting out of that current or not and uh so i even debated about whether to tell my wife about it when I got home, cause <laughs> I was afraid she wouldn't let me go out on any more painting excursions. Well, now the world um, knows. Yeah. Well, there you go. 
So that, that's a great story. Any any others? Maybe got got one more from your journal that would be um, might be fun to share. Um, well, there was one where I was painting the snow up in um, Summit County, Colorado, um, along the Blue River, which is where I I love to paint. It's one of my favorite spots, and um, I like to paint when it's real cold because you get these little ice shelves on the shore of the river. So um, I don't know. It was about. 15 degrees or something like that. And I was out walking this, the bank of the river to, you know, see where a good spot to paint was. And I saw another a pair of footprints out there and I thought, what in the world? I mean, this is, you know, daybreak and it's freezing, you know, it's too cold for fishermen. So I started looking closer and, um, it was mountain lion tracks. So oh, lovely. it was just me and me and this mountain lion were the only two out there. And you know, mountain lion are pretty stealthy anyway, um, but when you have a mountain lion in snow, they're pretty much completely silent. So um, I was I was just always looking over my shoulder thinking that any time this morning, uh, you know, this cougar could come down. What they do is, is you never hear them. You just feel them hit on the back of your neck. Right. And they, they bite on the back of their neck, your neck. So that was kind of running chills up my spine that morning because i you wouldn't i would never know it would just be you're you're okay or you're not okay um and you know you'll no matter how uh, vigilant you try to be you know they're they're pretty they're i'm more afraid of them than i am grizzly bears because you can see a grizzly and know where they are but mountain lions are a different different kind of danger they jump out of trees Um, yeah yeah they well or rocks or you know they they're, you know, they're excellent predators. They know exactly what they're doing. And you're, you're just a sitting duck, you know, out there if they, if they wanted to. So, but there's lots of, you know, lots of different stories of, you know, things, some are minor, some are major, but, um, but just, you know, I think that's, and I've listened to your, you know, other podcasts where, you know, that's what draws artists to plain air painting is, is just these experiences that, when you're standing there and you're quiet and you're painting, it's not like you're, uh, it's not like you're a fisherman or a hunter or even a hiker. You're just completely still. It's almost like you're in a deer stand and then the animals come to you. Like I've had snowshoe hares come and sit right by my feet like a puppy hmm. because they could tell that I wasn't, um, there wasn't a, a threat. And I've seen, you know, um, I've had otters and mink and, um, I've seen, you know, deer come and battle right in front of me or, you know, two bucks battling and they never even knew I was there. They just went at it and fought and ran off. And <laughs> I was just a silent spectator, but, um, but whether you're witnessing a sunrise or, you know, animals or, um, you know, or just the, the river flowing by, I mean, you're, you're in a very unique position when you're playing air painting. You're, you're a silent observer to all of these things that go on. I had a fellow They're tell me. Amazing. Had a fellow tell me one time a a, a a photographer by the name of Fred Picker who studied with Ansel Adams. Fred always said the best photographs, and I think this also applies to paintings. The best photographs come from the person willing to get up the earliest, walk the furthest, and uh, and be patient for you know the right moment, uh, because sometimes there is a right moment. You know when the light just nails it yeah absolutely absolutely that's been my experiences and so many times when i go hiking i get up at three in the morning um to try to be where i want to be you know be at the lake by sunrise not just you know have my first coffee you know most people are having their coffee when uh all this drama is going on and many times i've hiked down the trail and people are hiking up and i'm thinking to myself you guys just missed the most spectacular show (laughs) while you were you know brushing your teeth down there. So when you've got a sunrise um, so, and, and that sunrise essentially, you know, the color is hitting for about five to seven minutes tops. Uh, do you get in there, try to kind of put in some basic architecture, so to speak, some, you know, some bones. So you kind of have certain things in place and then you just uh, slash in the color. What do you do? How do you be prepared for a sunrise? Sunrises are, I think, harder than sunsets because at least in sunsets, 
you can see what what's going to be silhouetted. Well, there's two ways to do that. And you're right. You don't, it's kind of a surprise. Um, in the different times of year, the angle of the sun is different. You know, it's different in summer than it is in the winter because of the, the, the amount of daylight. But um, so even a you look on a peak and the shadow is going to be different in June than it's going to be in December. But um, either one, I've been there before. So I've kind of seen it and missed it or, um, you know, saw it from my car or, you know, wasn't able to, didn't have my paints with me or something. So I kind of make a mental note, you know, sunrise on this peak is spectacular. Or um, if I'm going to a place I haven't been, I'll go on online and let's say I'm painting, um, you know, Glacier National Park or something. And I'll look at, you know, as many pictures of Iceberg Lake as I can, even though I've never been there. And you kind of say, okay, this is kind of what it looks like in the summer, you know, in the summertime and the fall. And, and you kind of get a general idea where the shadows lay or how the configuration is of the, you know, of what you're painting that particular lake or mountain. Um, and then I also use topo maps. So typographical maps that orient where the rise and the, you know, the, the fall of the land is. So if I'm hiking, I can figure out, okay, I don't want to be on the trail right here. If I hike up to this little point, I can get a view of the whole valley, um, and which is a much better perspective of this view than just down, you know, in the valley where the trail is. So I also use um, those maps to kind of plan out what my day is. And then on a planar painting trip, I, I kind of set an itinerary, like I'll paint, okay, this angle in the morning, and then I'll go over here and do a midday painting and then work my way down, do another one mid afternoon. And then for sunset, I'll try to drive 10 miles down the road and, and, you know, capture this other scene that I, that is a sunset kind of scene. So kind of chart it out and then you can be very productive. And once you finish, you pack up and go right to the next spot and try to get ready for that. So uh, that's just how I do it. I don't know how other, if other artists um, do it differently, but. Um, I just try to be as productive as possible when I'm out there. Well, Jay, this has been a, a really terrific interview. You've got lots of great stories. Do you have any final thoughts for everybody listening? No, I just said, you know, paint from life. I, you know, I hear artists that email me questions and say they've been trying to paint from photographs. And I really don't know how to answer a question if you've been painting from photographs because it gives you, you know, a lot of the, the wrong information. But as long as you're painting from life, then, um, you know, a lot of these things are going to, you're going to, you're going to take care of themselves naturally, like the, how to create depth or, you know, how to see water or, you know, the true colors. Um, so even if you're doing figures or still life or landscape, whatever you decide to paint, you know, paint and draw from life, because it's even a different part of your brain um, than copying. So I can teach people to, to copy, to render um, that's, I can take people off the sidewalk and show them how to copy a comic book or, you know, render a, a picture out of a national geographic. That's just, you know, item for item. But when you're in outdoors, you're taking three dimensional, three dimensions into two and that you have to use a different part of your brain for that. And so it's for, you're forced to interpret what you're seeing. And so that's when it starts to become art and that's when it starts to become you and your your style your personality and your preferences and and so that's where it all happens terrific where can we see your work um well i have my studio here in parker uh colorado which is just south of denver about 45 minutes from the airport so anybody's welcome to come by and see uh new work here um i also show a sax gallery in cherry creek in denver um and with astoria fine art in jackson hole and your website? Uh, my website is uh, jmorestudio.com. All right, terrific. Well, you may have a rash of people showing up during the Plein Air Convention in Denver in May. Well, that'd be nice. I just say just text me or email me. Email is the best way to set up an appointment, but I'd be more than happy to meet as many people as I can. All right. Well, thank you for being on the Plein Air Podcast. My pleasure, Eric. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Jay Moore. What great stories and what a wonderful artist. Thank you, Jay. Are you ready for some marketing ideas? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer art marketing questions from our audience so we can help you sell more art. Somebody asked me if I make up questions. Yeah, once in a while I do, and usually I say if I made it up, but 
most people just email their questions to me, eric at artmarketing.com. At my other conference, the Figurative Art Convention and Expo FACE, which we held in Williamsburg, I held a marketing session and somebody has sent a question that said um, that I had mentioned that I sold three paintings to somebody who was interested in a single painting from my Cuba trip and would I explain that a little bit more. So here's what it was. Um, essentially, I took a group of 100 plein air painters to Cuba for the first time, which was kind of historical. So one of the galleries in Annapolis decided to hold a show. Most of us, or many of us anyway, sent three paintings to the show. I sold one, others sold several. Anyway, several months after the show, a guy who had bought one of my paintings had been following me on Instagram. And I had posted a picture of an old Ford that I painted. Or maybe an old Chevy, that's what it was, an old Chevy that I painted. And uh, anyway, the original painting was the whole street scene and the car, and I decided I didn't like the composition, so... I actually took the board and cut it down, but there was a whole other painting left over that was still a pretty good painting. It just was like the streets of Cuba. And so um, anyway, this guy bought the painting on Instagram, and when he bought it, I included the other painting, and I sent a note, told him what happened, and said, here, here's an extra painting uh, because you could frame it and put it next to it, uh, but it was originally part of the original thing. And I said, by the way, here are a couple of other things that you might like. And I put pictures of other paintings in, physical pictures. And he contacted me and he said, yeah, I want to buy these other pictures too. And he ended up buying three and so totally four paintings from me. And the law of reciprocity kicked in. And I'm going to talk about that the next question. But the idea that I gave him something a little extra, sent a nice personal note, offered something else to him when he was buying was an opportunity for him to buy more. So I think that's a good time. One of the best times to sell a painting is when a painting has just been sold. We get dopamine in our system. When we get out our credit card, we feel good. We're buying something. We're inclined to buy more. That's why they have all that stuff at the cash register at Walmart, right? All that extra stuff that's impulse. You buy things because you feel like buying. Uh, McDonald's will say, do you want fries with that? The reason they do that is because you're already buying something. If they can get a little bit more money out of you, they will. So it's a chance to leverage a purchase into another purchase before they go. So let me, uh, let me, let me show you a couple of examples. For instance, um, you could say, hey, uh, thanks for buying this uh, before I ring it up. Let me show a couple other paintings to you that I think you might like. Or um, I have a couple other paintings that I intended to really be hung together in a kind of a series, and I thought I'd show them to you. Let's go over here and look. They might just grab one of them and, and, or a couple of them and buy something more since they already have got themselves in the mindset of buying. And sometimes you could say, well, you know, since you bought this, I'll give you a little discount. I don't like just discounting, but sometimes if there's a reason, you know, you just bought a $2,000 painting, I'm going to give you a little discount on this other $2,000 painting because you just bought it. I think that makes sense. Anyway, that hope that helps. The next question is from Marilyn in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which I love. Marilyn says, can you explain the law of reciprocity? I mention it in my book, and uh, she wants to know how I do it to sell art. Well, that law of reciprocity just kind of is explained in that last story where I sent a little extra piece of the painting. Simply stated, human nature in most cultures is that when someone does something nice for us, we want to return the favor. If someone buys you dinner, next time they'll buy you dinner, right? Or you'll buy them dinner. And uh, if somebody gives you a gift, you want to give them a gift in return. And sales and marketing, it can really work well for you. So research indicates that no matter the size of the gift, if you give something, people want to do something in return. And sometimes that will result in a sale that might be expensive. I have a friend that owns a gallery, a little artist-owned gallery, and when somebody comes in, they have this rack there, and the rack has all these note cards of her paintings. And they're like five ninety-five each. They're not expensive. And when they walk in and she notes that there seemed to be somebody who could be a potential buyer, she'll say, hey, thanks for coming into the gallery. I'd love for you to take a pick a couple of note cards and take them home with you because it's good for me. You know, people will see your notes on my paintings and it spreads the word. And they're going to see that it's a five ninety five card and they're getting a couple of them and she just pick a couple out of the rack. Well, people feel good about that. 
The reality is they, she does them on her printer. It doesn't cost her much to make them, and it's a really good entry point. So now they're feeling like they need to do something in return, so they're going to try a little harder subconsciously to maybe pick out something to buy because they want to return the favor. So they don't necessarily know they're doing it. Now, you can use that small concept gift uh, in many situations to warm hearts and draw people closer to you. It's, sometimes it's just a matter of a little piece of candy or handing somebody a bottle of water. The little things like that make them feel obligated and feel like they want to return the favor. And the bigger it is, the better it works up to a point, and then too much of a gift seems a little suspicious. And of course, it's probably unaffordable anyway, but you don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. Anyway, that's the law of reciprocity. You can study that. There's so much information in marketing books around the world about the law of reciprocity, and it's reciprocal. The idea is that you're giving back. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. I'm going to be doing three mornings of training, art marketing and sales training, how to sell art at our art marketing boot camp three mornings in a row during the Plen Air Convention this May in Denver. People have come to that and told me it was worth the price of admission for the entire convention. I hope it's true. I hope to deliver. I got a lot of new stuff this year. I'm always learning new things and sharing new things and walking you through things that will help make you a better marketer. And, of course, I have those all out on video as well, and they're different every year. So lots of marketing training available for you. And, of course, marketing training at artmarketing.com. Anyway, this is this week's Art Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. If you've not got your tickets to the Plein Air Convention, be sure to get one, uh, one of the last 115 at plenairconvention.com. Be sure to also enter your best paintings at plenairsalon.com. Try to go for that $15,000 prize in the cover of Plein Air magazine. And if you've not seen my Sunday blog, I think we're up to, I think pretty close to, if not exceeded, a quarter of a million readers now. It absolutely blows me away. It's called Sunday Coffee. And it's growing because people tend to forward it to their friends because I talk about life and philosophy and ideas and things like that. So it's not so much about art and painting, believe it or not, but there's a little of that in there too. Anyway, it's called Sunday Coffee. You can get it for free at coffeewitheric.com. That's me, Eric. Well, it's always fun to do this. We'll get, it, get into this again next week. Uh, next week, we've got some great stuff for you. So just come on back to the podcast. And you know, it's always helpful if you want to leave a comment, go to Apple or whatever your provider is, give us a rating and give us a comment, whatever rating you want to give. Obviously, we like the better ones, but if you don't like it, give it a low rating. Anyway, tell people what it means to you and why you listen to it, and uh, that'll be helpful. So just look up Plan Air Podcast and then give a rating. That'd be very helpful. So, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big, beautiful world out there. You need to paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plen Air Painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.